Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Tanya Fredanch Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8 RCN, Channel 82 and Files Channel 964. The Council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings Beginning in April and running through June, we strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony on the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of the hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at the end of each departmental, in this, in this case, um, actually in between rounds of questionings um, at each hearing, and also at a hearing dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash tv. Our scheduled hearing dedicated to public testimony is on Wednesday, May 17th at 6 p.m. You can also give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. We are having uh, issues with our elevators um, today. Uh, if you have accessibility issue and you're at home and on your way to City Hall, uh, we would advise you for accessibility uh, purposes. Please sign up um, virtually, test for your virtual testimony. Um, you can do this by using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation or residence and limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video or uh, of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on a city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 0760 to 0762, orders for the FY24 operating budget including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. OPEB, docket 0763, dockets 0765 to 0766, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations, docket 0764, 0767 to 0768, orders for the capital budget including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be an overview of the FY24 budget for the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. Our panelists for today's hearing is um, uh, Director Attorney Stephanie Everett and uh, Deputy Director John, is it Stice? Thank you. Um, I've been joined by my counselor colleagues um, here, Counselor Aaron Murphy at large, Counselor Lou Jean at large, Counselor Julia Mejia at large, Counselor Liz Braden, District 9. For our um, Format uh, for this hearing, we will go first to opening statements, just 30 seconds to each counselors, then to administration for their presentation, then uh, round one of questioning of five minutes, round, then we'll go into public testimony, um, and then a round two of uh, questions from our council colleagues uh, with three minutes each to ask. Um, and if time allows, a uh, final round or third round, um, from my council colleagues, and then a closing statement, um, if uh, time allows. For, uh, just to understand the, the format to my council colleagues, if you leave for a while, I will skip you and go to um, another counselor, um, so you will lose your turn until you return, and then uh, you'll be placed last until, um, and so forth depending on the round. Even if you leave a couple of times, I'll do that until we finish up the round. I will allow you to ask the questions, but if you come in the second round, you're only getting th three minutes. If you come in a closing remarks uh, portion of it, you will only get one minute. Um, Councilman, did you have a question? So, 
I didn't get something and come back in? Did that lose our turn? Uh, or, no, no. Are you saying like five minutes? Give me a time frame so that I know what this looks like. No problem. Some people leave for about 20 minutes. Okay. And if you leave for that duration of time, I, w I would not be able to wait for you. Got it. Um, and then I'll place you last um, so that we can continue the role. Got it. Thank you. No problem. Um, in the interest of being fair in terms of our time, um, and so to the panelists, we'll ask you questions, and it's a pretty f uh, free-flowing kind of uh, thing, but I will uh, have to ask that people yield their time at five minutes exactly, um, and basically they can ask it any way they want. They can ask all five or ten questions within the five minutes, or 20 <laughs> if they have the time, and I will allow the administration to fully respond um, and at that point, continue on to the next counselor. Without um, any further ado, uh, Councillor Murphy, you have the floor for 30 seconds for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to the Director, Stephanie, and John, Deputy Director, for being here. Um, just here to hear your, um, you know, how it's going. I know you're a newer office, and as you expand, making sure that we are providing you the correct resources to make sure that you can do your job effectively. So please let us know during this hearing or um, you know, before we vote on the budget if there's things you're feeling that are missing from your requests in the budget and making sure that we're not during the amendment se section of the process we now have on the council that we're not cutting things from your budget because we didn't think it was necessary or anything like that. So thank you for being here and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Uh, Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to both um, Stephanie and Mike for being here. John. John, sorry, John. <laughs> this is why I should just be saying director and all that. So uh, thank you all for being here. I hope, I mean, it's not my intention that we would cut any, your budget is already not that big uh, for the incredible amount of work that you have to do on behalf of the public in terms of providing transparency and oversight. You're a nascent office, still growing and still growing into yourself in terms of providing the accountability and transparency that the public really demanded that really gave birth to this office. So I want to thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. You all do a really great job at dashboards already, which I think other city departments can really learn from, how we um, do better um, with data and providing it in dashboards, but what do we do from, from there? So thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to hearing um, your presentation. Thank you. Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the deputy and uh, a deputy director. I don't want to get the names wrong either, but what's up, staff? I'm really excited to, to be here, especially since I am the dashboard queen. Um, and I know you guys have been really instrumental in making sure that every piece of information is being um, uploaded. And also working alongside Councillor um, Campbell and Councillor Arroyo to establish this particular um, office, I'm really excited to hear about your progress and the work that you've been doing and looking forward to learning how we can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. What time of the day is it? Uh, I just look forward to hearing an update. I know we've had some conversations. You've met with me a couple of times with an update and just uh, how, your, how your new office is uh, working and how, you, how you're ramping up. and. Um, and hearing progress and how we might be able to help. Thank you, good for you, and John as well. Welcome both, thank you. Uh, thank you, we've been joined by our council colleague, Councillor Baker. Uh, Councillor Baker, our deepest uh, condolences to you and your family. Thank you. Uh, for your loss, and um, you have um, about a minute to an opening statement. Thank you, um, good afternoon, Stephanie, how are you? Good to see you, and how are you? I don't know who you are, but we'll get to know you here in this, yes, sir. this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'm good. Uh, thank you, Councillor Baker. Councillor President uh, Flynn, we were just explaining the format um, and giving opening statements um, that round one consists of five minutes for your questions, round two uh, then to public testimony if there are any in person, round two of three minutes, round three of three minutes if time allows, and then closing statement. Please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. No opening statement for me. Just want to say thank you to the panel for being here. Thank you. Uh, we'll go straight to the administration. Welcome, and uh, please, uh, you have the floor for your presentation. Great. Thank you all again for having us. Um, 
Again, my name is Stephanie. Can everyone here, and this is my deputy, John, for those who came in after um, we did a little introduction. But I just wanted to, I know I've met with everyone here just to give you an introduction of what we were doing over uh, my time. I've been here two years last week, um, but wanted to, again, just give a presentation on who we are in the office and some updates on what we're doing and where you can get some information in our office and our budget. Um, so as you know, we are an independent office. We are independent of the Boston Police Department. Um, we do serve as a single point of entry for individuals, um, and that includes Boston Police Department um, personnel um, who are looking to file complaints against one and um, civilian personnel of the Boston Police Department. So we handle complaints, um, and I will go through the process and how complaints, well, John will probably walk you through that, how those complaints go through our office. We also look at policies that, um, current and proposed policies that Boston Police Department have going on. Um, my office also supports the work of the three boards that we have in our office, and again, I'll go through that. Um, so we do have three boards um, that come through our office. You can go to the next slide. I, I'm not good at... I think the clicker stopped working. Yeah, I, I'm not good. I think everyone had... Does everyone have our presentation? There you go. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not really good at reading through the slides. I hope you all... Um, I should have said that in the beginning. I'm a person who just talks. I think you can read through the slides. I know what my office does by heart, so I don't really need to go <laughs> line by line through the office. Um, Feel free to present in whatever yes. way. So we have three boards and a new council. So the three boards that we do have is the um, Civilian Review Board, which receives the complaints um, that come in from um, civilians and, again, personnel they can file from Boston Police Department in our office. And we also have the OPAC Commission. The OPAC Commission is comprised of myself as the um, ED of the office, as well as the chair of the Civilian Review Board and the chair of the Eternal Affairs Oversight Panel. We call it IOP. Um, the IOP is made of five members. The Civilian Review Board is made up of nine members. Um, the three of us make up the OPAC Commission, and we are the ones that have subpoena power. I like to stress that a lot because when we were first um, introduced, a lot of people confuse the Civilian Review Board with the OPAC Commission and would think that the Civilian Review Board is the one who has the, o the subpoena power. The subpoena power lies with the OPAC Commission. Um, the Civilian Review Board is the one who makes recommendations on complaints to the commissioner on discipline um, for complaints that come in and also reviews policy. The OPAC Commission, again, has subpoena powers. Um, we set the calendar for the other boards. We um, look at rules and regulations for the other boards. So we are basically the overarching um, entity for the o other boards. And then there is my staff. Um, and then the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel, they review complaints that originally were reviewed at the Boston Police Department. Um, internal Affairs Division, um, and they look at them for um, fairness and thoroughness. They make recommendations whether they agree with the decision that was made, so the appeals, if someone appeals their um, decision by the IAD, the appeals, all appeals come to us. We are the appellant for those appeals. We, the board will make a decision whether or not they agree or disagree, or they believe that the Boston Police Department needs to do further investigation. So those are the three boards that are mandated by the ordinance. And looking at the work that we were doing, um, one voice that was left out, because there was only one, um, and I know Council Mejia will enjoy this as well, because there was only one voice on the Civilian Review Board for a youth. Um, so we created the Youth Advisory Council. The Youth Advisory Council, um, it's new, so they'll have 15 members for ages 14 to 19. Um, those voices are something that I believe that we needed to have heard. Last year in the budget, we had a high school internship and college internship, um, thank you so much, um, staffed in our budget. And those students, um, high school students get paid $18 an hour, college students get paid $22 an hour. Um, I believe in a, a lot of things, including that we can figure out ways to increase our, our wealth opportunities in this city, and we can do it through teaching our children how to do um, a lot of things, including how to participate in government. 
Um, and so the Youth Advisory Board is another way that we're going to introduce them in there, and that's in our budget for FY24 as well, and that's giving stipends to these children. Um, I'm also, I've talked to you all about the Youth Advisory Council, we call it YAC, and I'm, invited, I'm gonna invite you all again, come on in and talk to our kids. Um, they are great kids, we have nine people, nine kids on our, um, our Youth Advisory Council now, but it can go up to 15. They are creating their structure right now, whether they're gonna have a president or a chair, they're very much involved in how their structure will be. Um, so that's our newest board that we have. I'm probably driving, driving you crazy, so you can just keep flipping through if you want. Um, <laughs> you just have to say next slide because the clicker yeah. doesn't work. Oh, so the next slide, we can just keep going. You can hit the next slide and then the next one. Um, so this is our office structure. So this gives you a bit of where we are at in our office. Um, when I first came in two years ago, it was a party of one for seven months. Now we have grown substantially. We still have some office openings. Um, right now on this, it's wrong. It says that we have um, three vacancies in our interns. We actually have only one. Um, our interns, we have one from Boston Latin School, one who attends, our college student attends BU. Um, and we still have two openings inside of our intake specialist positions and um, one in a investigator. So if you know anyone, you can still send them our way. But we are definitely growing um, over the last two years and will continue to grow. So we are hoping to fill um, some of those seats. Um, and we should fill, not hoping we will be doing a lot more outreach um, as we learn more of ourselves and more of what the role is so that we can fill those seats in FY24. Um, the next slide. Yeah, thanks, and so Director. I'm going to let John take over from here. John, as deputy, um, we call him our I team, the investigative team. Um, it encompasses our intake specialists, our investigators, and now our newly hired community intake, um, a community mediator who I will introduce all of you all to sooner rather than later. He just started a month ago. Um, but he can, he's the immediate supervisor, walk you through how the um, complaints come into our office and how we deal with them in our office. Yeah, thanks, Director. I won't go into too much detail. Feel free to ask any questions that arise. Um, but this is our flow chart. It's pretty pretty basic, um, but just kind of shows the two tracks that the director was talking about. So folks can come to us and file new complaints uh, alleging uh, misconduct uh, by Boston Police Department officers, or they can appeal complaints that have already been heard and decided on at the Boston Police Department as long as they file that with us within 14 days of receiving the de decision from the BPD. So uh, with the complaint, when it comes in, a couple different tracks. Um, the intake specialists, they really determine to make that first recommendation whether or not something's in scope. Oftentimes, as you'd imagine, we get a lot of complaints about Quincy Police Department, Cambridge Police Department. Um, we tell those folks immediately that uh, we're not able to, to assist with that. But luckily now, between um, some of the departments having their own complaint intake processes, as well as the state uh, post commission, we are able to essentially send anyone who comes to us to uh, the right uh, avenue for whatever they're uh, looking to, to file a complaint about. Um, but as Stephanie mentioned, we do have the mediation capacity uh, that'll be um, coming in our department very, very soon, having onboarded that community mediator about a month ago. And um, you can see some of the outcomes that uh, the Civilian Review Board can come to. Um, and those recommendations for the Civilian Review Board, they come from OPAT staff when the investigators do a fair and thorough investigation, which includes uh, requesting documents from the Boston Police Department, and they will make that recommendation to the Civilian Review Board, who ultimately decides and, and votes if they um, um, agree with that recommendation or would like to go with a, a different disposition on the, that case. Um, next slide, please. And then, uh, as Councilor Mejia mentioned, this is one of our dashboards. Um, we're really excited to be able to provide these to the public. Um, this specific one is our complainant uh, demographic dashboard. So in the city ordinance that established OPAT, there's very specific things that they ask us to report out on uh, when it comes to the complainants. So that's why you see um, things like the race of complainant, sexual orientation, age, gender, all that stuff. Um, that is specifically in city ordinance that requires us to report out on. Next slide, please. And then Can just, I just say that this, that is just like one of them. Our dashboards are very detailed. We have it down to, we have youth, it's by age. Um, you can go down to the zip code, 
um, it's a very detailed website to find out um, specifically what's going on in any neighborhood. Yeah, and thanks to the city's data and analytics team, you're able to filter those results by neighborhood and really get a good idea of what's going on where in the city uh, in terms of our complaints and the things that are being submitted, so that's, that's great. And then as far as our budget, um, as you can see, about 86% of our budget is personnel expenses. Um, so uh, the, the other 14%, just to highlight the non-personnel accounts here, current charges, um, that contains our office lease that's paid annually, so that's pretty much that, that entire account. And the other um, high percentage there, 5%, that's contracted services. That is for um, the consultant that's reviewing the, the black, indigenous, and persons of color officers' experiences within BPD. That was an FY23 investment that we were really grateful to receive, as well as uh, some other things like professional development um, and our office cleaning contract is in that uh, account as well. Next slide, please. And these next two slides just break out um, comparing FY23 approved versus FY24 recommended. So as you can see, our budget's actually going down a little bit in our permanent employees line. That's uh, actually a, a salary savings calculation that OBM has done, so that trues up uh, our numbers a little bit. It's basically assuming one of our 15 positions will be vacant throughout the, the whole fiscal year. So that's, that's, that's about accurate, so uh, we're comfortable with that. Um, and then you can see that, that small amount. So FY24 is the first time we've had a budget for emergency employees. That was a shift of our um, intern positions that, again, was an FY23 investment that we're grateful for. That was shifted from um, contracted services, I believe, to our 511 emergency employees. So, again, no new money or anything like that. It's a, a request made by auditing to make that change. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, just a look at our, our non-personnel accounts going from FY23 approve to FY24 recommended. Um, and as you can see, we, we've kind of touched on all the changes already to this point. Um, so I don't think any, any more to add there. Next slide. Thank you. Oh, that was, thank you. I heard yeah. next slide, then thank you. Yeah, no, that I thought was it was it. next slide, thank you for <laughs> switching it. Um, yeah, we're, thank we're, you as in your, presentation you all yeah. said. Um, yeah. That has to be one of the most transparent, um, comprehensive, short and sweet, all of the above, thorough, but short and sweet presentations I've seen. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. I feel like I, I don't know about my colleagues, but I feel like I really know what you do. I really, like I really get it. Um, and I feel like I really understand the numbers. Um, so thank you for the transparency and thank for the thoroughness. Uh, we'll go to my council colleagues by order of arrival. Council Murphy, you have the floor. You caught the chair off guard. You were done so quick. She, she was expecting more now. And your dashboards, like you mentioned before, are great. And so I've been looking at them. No specific questions, just thank you for explaining the expansion and the staffing. And like I said, just make sure if there's a need, just reach out, but I don't have any, you did a great job explaining. And like you said, you feel comfortable with how this budget is being brought forward. So definitely in support of it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wanna thank you again, um, D Director and Deputy Director for being here and for that presentation. Um, yeah, the dashboards are great. I'm, before I get into the dashboards, I want to ask a question regarding, I think it's enab enabling legislation, where it says that one of the things that you will be doing is creating a racial equity assessment tool to periodically evaluate current and proposed BPD policies and procedures. Has that happened yet? So that's one of the things that we are trying to work on with um, the consultant we have. So we're looking at the Right now, our consultant is looking at the hiring, retention, and promotion of BPD, uh, within BPD. And then we are still trying to get through all of the asks that we have inside of the ordinance, step by step. So the first thing we needed to do was look at um, the dashboard. So we just got the dashboards done probably two months ago, where every check mark we had to do for the dashboards were up. 
The next thing is that we are by ordinance required to do a semi-annual report and an annual report, which you all receive. Um, and in that annual report, we realized that there were all these different asks, including the retention, hiring, and promotion, and um, dismissal of police officers. And it was clear to me that we were asking for information, but we weren't receiving um, that information in. I know that there's been a lot of studies that were done, but in those studies, th there were no implementation steps, and I need to have implementation. This is the reason why we were asking for um, an extension, because we did have our consultants speak to all um, everyone in BPD that has been involved over the years around um, hiring, promotion, and retention efforts. Um, but one of the things, it, it does come up with the equity tools. What do we do around that? And we've talked to our equity, our um, chief, when I first started um, here a couple of years ago, was about what do we do about this tool? What is it that we need to create? So they are on the list of the things that we need to continue to check off, but we just need to figure out what it is exactly that we need to do as far as what is it that BPD is doing, what is the dashboard's doing, um, and what is the chief in equity doing. So there's all these different programs going on, and we, we don't want to duplicate efforts, but we also want to make sure that we are answering the questions that I believe are like top priorities um, right now for our city um, and answering um, the dashboards and everything else on the ordinance list. Thank you. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's important that we, like you said, that we get it right. Um, but that we also, in doing so, because it's a, it's a something that I hear as a citywide city councilor, you hear from uh, different officers about glass, you know, ceilings or difficulties in advancement, especially for our BIPOC um, police officers. And so I wanted to make sure that in doing so, we also have discussions with Mamlio for, um, and that we have discussions with Jade Association, and I think it's the Jade Society for Asia AAPI officers, and with Jago. Um, that I think could also tell us and help inform how we build that assessment. I think it's really important. So the consultant has spoken with, I think, everyone you just named mm -hmm. um, in their work. So they began working in November. And so part of it was that there were, again, I'm not a fan of repeating efforts. I feel like we already know what the issues are. I want you to do the work. Um, and so what we wanted the consultant to focus on is what were some of the barriers and why some of the things that were recommended before weren't done, um, and what were some of the things that we can, like long-term, short-term, now goals. Um, and so a lot of those um, things that you just named were things that they were able to, the groups that you saw, groups you just named were groups that they did go to mm -hmm. to get those questions answered and what we can do going forward. So the next phase for me is the implementation. I didn't want, I think a lot of times we get reports, I don't think, I know. A lot of times we get reports and it's like, this is the problem, and they list out all the problems, and they're problems that we already know. And I wanted the consultant to still be around to help BPD and our office and everyone else actually implement those things. So if there's a problem with, if there's a problem with actually getting hiring done within BPD, if it's something that we need to do as a community, what is it that we need to do? You have to talk to the community, you have to talk to everyone else. So we need to have this third party help us get those things done. Um, and so I wanted someone to stay around to do it and not give us a report and then ask us to figure it out. Yeah. So And so when, once you have that information, and this is true for everything, like once you have the information from the consultants, like I look at this dashboard that talks about Complaints being dismissed, insufficient evidence, not sustained, out of scope, and then a majority of them are pending when I look at this dashboard. Once you have the information, what are you empowered to do when it comes to hiring and using the racial equity system? What are we empowered to do from that? And then, like, what is the other status for complaints that we're not seeing because no action has been taken? Oh, so I should just say that the, the dashboard is just a sample. It's not a real dashboard. That was just showing you what we have. So I don't want you to think, don't read that dashboard as well. Oh, no, this is the dashboard that we oh, printed out from printed my out. office, yes. separate from. So we have, um, so it just depends on where they're going. So there's a lot of reasons why dashboards are pending, why a case may be pending. Um, and I'm happy to have a, a further conversation with you about why things are pending. It could be we haven't heard from the complainant. It could be we, we only meet, the civilian review board meets quarterly. Um, they have met a couple of times, and there's not been form the last two meetings, three meetings that they've had. So some cases are pending because of form. Um, and it, it's a host of reasons why cases are pending. If it's out of scope, it's because it's not a rule. Um, then as John said, it could be a rule that's not 
um, broken or it's um, sometimes it's a parking issue. Thank you. Thank you. Things. And I just want to say a thank you Sorry, to Maria Sabir for the Boston right. Trust Act. She's been doing incredible work that providing that information between yes. ICE and I like that BPD has not had any information to report. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Jen. Council Mejia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to say thank you again, Stephanie, for taking on the creation and the implementation because I really do believe things on paper look really good, but where we usually end up coming short is the implementation process and also accountability. So I just really appreciate your, um, your effort there. So I just have a few questions. Um, the Office of um, the Police Accountability and Transparency has not previously had a budget for emergency employees. Um, can you just, and in 2024, it seeks a budget of $32,000. Can you just tell us how would emergency employees be utilized? Like, what's your vision for that? Yeah, I, I can answer that one, Counselor. So that was uh, a request by auditing to move our intern funds from our contracted services budget to emergency employees. It was a payroll thing. I believe it, it's something to do with federal requirements. Okay. But so that was really just a request by auditing. That was an FY23 investment. Um, so not new funding or new emergency employees, so to speak. They're, they're interns. Okay. Um, and then it's just I'm, our intern account. It's okay. not emergency. So okay. they're just like our it. interns. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about the communication budget is increasing by $5,000, which I'm really excited about because we know that in order for you all to be set up for success, people actually need to know that you exist and how to navigate. Is, is what are, What's the communication plan for this? How are you going to... So that's actually our cell phones. So, right, our oh, cell phones. Damn. Um, so <laughs> that is just the cell phones in the office. But I could tell you, but I want to answer that in two parts. So, one, that line item is just for the cell phone communication. But what we have done over the last, what we did in February and we will continue to do, and the reason why we do have a community mediator, we did have a get to know OPAT session in, um, sessions in February. And that was where we went. Um, we had one in Roxbury, we had one in West Roxbury, and we had one, um, see the third one. In multiple languages? Yeah. Yes, we had them in multiple languages. Um, we had one, and we had one virtual. So that's what the third place. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that was for people to get to know what we do so that we can start demystifying who we are as an office yeah. and try to draw people in. So we will have more events. So we're having one on June. So one of our series that we're doing is get to know Commissioner Cox. One of the things that I've said from the beginning is that um, it's not about rebuilding trust, it is actually building trust in our communities. Mm -hmm. And I can't get people to trust something they don't know. Yes. And I need them to, you know, get to know Commissioner Cox. So on June 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Bowling Building, everyone here will get an invitation for that soon. Um, we will have a get to know Commissioner Cox where the community will get to engage with Commissioner Cox. These are not, it's not the media, it's, the, it's, for the, it's a community event. Yeah. Um, so the community can speak to the commissioner. Yeah. Um, so we will have these different events happen yeah. around. Um, and those line items, and John can tell you what, which budget they come from, but those are the things that we are doing to really get, um, not just getting to know us, but also getting to know who Boston Police Department is. I love that. Um, I really want, you know, and it's, when we talk about our consultant and having, I don't want to take up your time, so go on. Yes, I was going to get a little anxious because Counselor Anderson yeah. does not play with her timer. Yeah, no, and I get it, and I appreciate the robust, um, and you could see that I'm getting anxious because yeah. I got to get this one more. <laughs> And this is going to be a little bit more um, controversial um, because you're talking about trust, and I, I think that there's still a lot of mistrust in the community when it comes to police. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why you all were born, right, in, in the height of all that. But I still feel like there's a level of, um, we, we can train people, we can do all that we can to create the type of environment where black and brown people in particular feel safe. Um, and I'm curious, um, how many cases can you just talk about kind of, um, I, I mean, people have DM'd me videos of police officers acting in ways that are just so unbecoming. Um, we have um, heard and have seen um, even within the department where some colleagues don't feel um, that their coworkers are being respectful of them. And so I'm just curious, given all the 
history that exists here in the city of Boston, what role, if any, will this office be playing to help address the deep racial tension that exists? And I know that's not your job to do, but I'm curious how it shows up in OPAD when it comes to discrimination and when it comes to just the relationship with police officers in general. How much time do I have? I want you to, I'm gonna yield the rest of my time so you can, and that's the last question I will ask. Um, so I, I want to, you know, so I was cautioned before to say that we don't operate as a monolith, but I do want to acknowledge that data is data and what has happened in our city and in our country is a real thing. Um, and that feelings are, are true around tensions in our city. Um, our office was not created because of what happened in 2020. Our office was created because of, because of. Because um, of forever? Yes. Um, I said this in my first semi-annual report, and I will say it again. And you know, in 1992, there was a St. Clair Commission report that actually asked for this office. Um, I, I can go on about how many reports were written after that, but there was one in 2005. There's, there was a lot of reports written for those who really think that this happened because of 2020. You can actually, 1992 is the latest. It, 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 there was a report in 1992. Um, so for those who think that this happened because of 2020 should read the St. Clair Commission report. Um, and that wasn't just because of Charles Stewart, there was five in custody deaths that happened in addition to Charles Stewart. Um, and that's why. So there were, I believe, three mayors, three different commissioners, and three different, four different reports, or three different reports that actually got to this office. Um, we have a history in this city, and I want um, to be clear that, and I say that not to, to point fingers, but we didn't get here overnight. We didn't get here because of one incident. Um, and I want people to have grace with themselves and grace with the city and grace with this office to know that we are not going to fix it in one night, and we're not gonna fix it in the two years that I've been here. Um, I tell people frequently that it took me a while to figure out what I needed to do in this office, and I needed to look and realize that there's three things that happen, happen all the time with police misconduct, whichever way you want to define it. I think a lot of people define police misconduct as a, um, aggressive um, use, of con um, use of force um, in a, whatever way you want to define it. I see that there is an individual harm and that individual harm has family um, loss. If the individual is harmed, the family suffers a loss because they don't have that, that individual to talk to, they don't have that individual to console, they don't have, they, that individual is somehow removed, whether they're in jail or they're mentally um, not there. And because of that, the whole community is impacted because that family has turned into themselves to support that individual who has been impacted. And so what I have to do in this office is try to figure out how do I address those three, the individual, the family, and the community. And the way that we have done it is trying to create spaces where there is opportunity, and that is either by creating jobs, our intake specialist, which was the first thing I asked for in the first budget. Um, I asked that you only have a high school diploma and you were making over 50 something thousand dollars. Um, education, we have a meet the commissioner, we have our speaking, the listening series, we do different things where we try to educate who we are. Having a website that's comprehensive, trying to get people to come outside, creating a space for youth, all those things, that's an opportunity, right? So we have to create opportunity. I created through um, the wealth. There's an $8 wealth gap to 247. So I do that in how we pay our employees. Our employees are paid well in our office. Um, if you look at the, the makeup of our staff, it is, it is well, it is good, we do well. But we also, again, we pay high school students $18 an hour, minimum wage is 15. So the way I do it in my office is that it's one thing, we had to look at individual family, community, 
create the opportunity, provide education, and deal with the wealth that is there. There is ways to do it, and you do it through opportunity education and start closing that wealth gap. So everyone has an opportunity. Everyone, I could sit and point fingers all day, or I can address it. Um, but I think everyone has to give themselves some opportunity, and we all have to give ourselves some grace. Um, and just know that we have a problem, and people aren't going to trust overnight. I can't expect people to trust OPAT. It's a government agency. It's not about it being police. It's about it being a government agency. I can try to get people, and I have been for the last few years, two years, get people to trust myself, get people to trust my staff, um, because it's easier to trust a person than it is to trust a government agency. So if I say I'm going to have something on June 15th at 6 p.m. at the Bowling Building, I'm going to have something on June 15th at 6 p.m., right? And that's how that works. Thank you, um, Director. Uh, Council Mejia, we'll come back to you. Okay. Just thank you. And I'm not going to be here for a second round, so just thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a long road, and uh, I trust we're moving in the right direction, but we're not there yet. <laughs> it's like the kids on the journey, you know, say, are we there yet? We're not there yet. Um, I would love to find a little more about the community medi mediator role and, and how effectively you've been able to use that and what sort of cases you you utilize the, the community mediator role in? Or if so, you have, yeah. yeah. They just started last month. <laughs> All right, I, I, I suspect that that might be the case, but then even, okay, um, you're, they're a new hire, what, what's their role going to be? Because I, I really believe yeah. that mediation and, and conflict yes. resolution is really important. So, um, exactly. I think when I first was hiring, I talked to you about this, but it's one of these things where um, I do believe, and as we move toward this, this road of trying to have community speak and have BPD speak, um, we have to have conversation and communication. So I believe that the community mediator's role is to create a uh, space for communication. So in the future, the, the role, well, soon, near future, um, is that there are some complaints that come in where it's clear that, um, again, community doesn't know what happens within BPD, why something happens. Um, and I believe that that's a, a, a good tool to start having that conversation so um, the, the complainant may need to know how our BPD operates. Or in reverse, that the um, police officer needs to know about our community, about the culture of our community, about why certain things happen so they can start to build a relationship. Um, I feel like there's times when you, someone lives in your neighborhood forever and you've never seen them, and then the one time you do see them and you meet someone somewhere and you've never seen them before, but you, you're at an event together and it's like, oh my God, you live three doors down, three, three blocks away, I never knew that, and now you see them all the time. Um, I believe that's how that interaction is going to happen. So if it's a negative one, you're going to see the officer all the time. But if you can make that one where, I'm not asking them to be friends, I'm asking them to have some mutual respect and be heard. A lot of times our community wants to be heard and they're not heard. Um, and I've talked to enough officers that they also want to be heard and they're not heard. So just trying to create this space where communication can start to grow. And I think it's, it's going to be a good program. Um, I know that Boston Police Department had this program before. And the difference between this program and our program is that with the program that was, and this is what I was told, I'm, I'm not saying this for certain, but BPD used to issue the complaint, then offer mediation. We're offering mediation, and if both parties say yes, the complaint wouldn't issue. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and then um, the Youth Advisory Council, I, I really feel that, you know, many of the issues that we see out in, out in Alston, Brighton, um, are really related to young people in the middle of COVID that have just got a lot of, there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges, a lot of stress, and um, kids act out and um, they get into some pretty serious <laughs> trouble. Um, I'm just thinking about the youth advisory. Like, uh, what's the makeup of the of the youth advisory council in terms of ethnic and, and cultural background, and, and also across the city, or, or is every neighbourhood represented? So I know that every neighbourhood is not represented. 
Um, I can get back to you on the exact neighborhoods. I can't think of if Alston Brighton, I feel like there is, but I can't say for certain. I know we, we talked about this before. Um, I can get back to you with the, the makeup of that um, and the, the diversity of it. I know it's, it is a diverse body, um, but I can definitely get back to you with that yeah. information. You know, and, and I'm not necessarily saying Alston Brighton needs to have a representative. I just really feel it's very important that youth um, the youth voice is incredibly important in, in this conversation, yes. and Absolutely. and and also uh, the other issue, uh, you know, thinking about community policing. Like I had a meeting recently um, where uh, folks, you know, there's there's an interest in actually bolstering and developing and strengthening our community policing. We we have some incredible community police officers who attend lots of community meetings in Alston Brighton, but then there's a particular sector of the community where they don't really have that. Le same level of interaction, and we have a lot of repair to do to try and um, re uh, reestablish uh, better relations and better, more trust uh, going forward. We're not there yet, but um, I feel that you know having a some sort of a forum or some sort of a space where um, supportive and concerned citizens can can get together and and develop and expand those relationships would be really important. I definitely will get back to you, and I will say that there's still openings on Youth Advisory Council. So it's a rolling application. We didn't close it out. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's good to see you, Stephanie. Um, I had the opportunity, Stephanie, to meet and talk with Mam Leo and Jade. Um, can you tell me how you're engaging these two? organizations in this process and what feedback are you looking for from Mam Leo and Jade and also the um, Latino Officers, Officers Association? Are you seeking their input? For the, just for clarity, is this for the consultant? No, just, just to get their view on, on, on your philosophy or, the, or, or what you hope to accomplish. Are, are you listening to some of the uh, minority police officers across the city. Yes, so I have spoken to different members of the organization. When I first started, a lot more than now. Um, I think at the beginning it was more heavier where everyone wanted to tell me what was going on and it really did help shape the request for a consultant. Um, so they're part of, the huge part of the reason why we did the consultant. Um, hearing about the promotional exams, hearing um, about the hiring and just really uh, the promotional examples with a lot of the stuff. So yes, I've, um, the consultant agreement, I would say, really bore out of those conversations, just knowing that they needed to be heard and where their, their voices were not as, as strong as they believed they should be um, because the exams they did not um, match who, where they believed they needed to be because they weren't coming um, as often as they should, so there was a lot of conversations around that. I also met recently with the Women Law Enforcement Association of Massachusetts. Are they also part of the discussion? Yes, so there is a group um, of us from the city who put together the um, RFP for the consultant, and before we even put the RFP together, we met with the group and the women um, in law enforcement actually were part of the group that we met with um, when we were considering the RFP. Okay. And what is the role of the consultant is to, is to kind of advise advise you on steps forward and in, in what you hope to accomplish, is that correct? It's really for the Boston Police Department. It's for the personnel there to find out what, again, there's been so many studies that have been done on the retention, hiring, and promotion with NBPD of BIPOC employees. Um, not just per not just sworn, but civilian personnel. Um, but what, basically, what are the hangups? Why is it not moving? What has been suggested? What can be done? Um, and really work on the steps and tools that need to be done, and start to move in that direction to get them done. So they've been working with. They've spoken to Mamlio. They've spoken with all of the affinity groups on what needs to be done to increase the hiring, work on the retention because you know there's been. Um, a lot of people leaving 
um, BPD, as you've read in the paper, mm -hmm. um, promotion, there was issues with the promotional exams. So just really giving a lot of that insight to what's going on, what can we do on a policy side. OPAT does have um, the ability to look at policies and procedures of BPD. So if there's something I need to be doing to work on or something that BPD needs to do. So we have some interim stuff that we've talked about, but there's a bigger report that's supposed to come out soon. Um, before the end of the fiscal year, and then next year is really like, how are we going to work with BPD to start implementing these steps? And who is the consultant you hired? So it's Conan Harrison Associates and Strategy Matters. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the one of the concerns I have, and I, I know you have it, you have as well. You mentioned is the retention the recruitment of minority police officers, women police officers, that's a priority for me and certainly I know it's, it's, for, it's for the administration as well. Um, how, do, how do we know um, police officers of color, poli women police officers, if they're unfortunately involved in any situation, what is their avenue of being represented to make sure that they're they're heard fairly during this process? I would have to talk to BPD about what happens with that, but I'm, I'm happy to get back to you about that because I'm not part of the hiring process. Um, but, and I, I haven't heard from the consultants that they have an answer on, on that, but I do know that in the interim stuff that we've talked about, they haven't really gotten down to how do they overcome some of the barriers in hiring. I've talked to um, you know, just the training itself, like the mental pre preparation for training, the physical preparation for training, but I do know that there are some, some barriers just getting to that door, and, and there's some things that are out of our control, like the civil service exam, um, but I'd be happy to look into some of the other barriers that you just spoke about. Th thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Council President Flynn, Council Collette, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both so much for your leadership. Director Everett, uh, you've been very accessible whenever I've had a question, and I really enjoyed our conversation back in November, um, just getting a chance to understand and, and better know how I can be helpful as, as city councilor. Um, and I do just want to say thank you to my colleagues on this body who worked to make this office a reality. I want to give a special shout out to now Attorney General Andrea Campbell and her staff. Um, many, many hours, many months trying to pull this together, especially the uh, civilian review board component of it. So um, do we wish that there were binding recommendations? Yes. Uh, but that's, that's another thing for another time. Um, but I did have a question on the Youth Advisory Council, and, and I want to thank Councillor Braden for, for bringing it up. But when we had last spoke, you were soliciting applications, and it sounds like you're still hoping for more folks. Um, I really feel like this is such an important part of your office. Um, it didn't, it, it was expedited in 2020, but as you mentioned, it's, it's here because of many, many years and generations of, um, of inequities in, in the criminal justice system. And, but in 2020, the difference was that the youth came out and said, absolutely not, no more. And so this is a really big part of a way in which they could make a difference and have um, tangible policy recommendations and solutions. So I would love to expand it. I see that it's, it's a minimum of nine members. So um, uh, Council Braden asked about the, the racial and ethnic makeup of the board, but who oversees it? What is the staff capacity and what will it take to expand it to have somebody from every single neighborhood because it is so important, I think, in, in your office's mission. So it's a minimum of nine because that's how many we have sitting there right now, but we're having, it goes up to 15. Okay. So we can have as many. I, I think it's, it's really like my imagination. <laughs> so we don't, I don't want anyone to think like we have a limitation on it. Um, I really, and you know, to your point, again, we, we had this conversation. I, I do believe that our feet are, you know, the marches have stopped in the street, but our feet are still moving, and I think our, the marches were our youth, right? And their feet need to still be moving. We need to teach them what is going on, and that's why I invited everyone to the office. I just ask that you don't sit at the table, let the kids sit at the table and continue doing the work that they started. Um, our staff, the investigative team, and my executive assistant, they have, I, was, I really want to do something with the kids. And they were excited about it, and then they sat me down, like, and I mean, not in a good way, like, sat me down and was like, okay, we'll see you later, this is our, the babies are ours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, that's who controls the Youth Advisory Council. Um, 
it's something that I'm like, okay, I, let's do this in my policy analyst. Um, so I, I don't think there's one, I think that's the group, so it's like a youth advisor, there's a youth group in our office who, um, John was saying that we have professional development. I have a rule in my office that the way you came in my office is not the way you leave, not just constituents, but also my staff. So my staff have a responsibility as well to grow. And so they all have taken on, there's a group of them have taken on being youth um, advisors. And so that's who has it. So it's, it's not about needing anything else. They, they have it. They happily have excused me out of the room and taken on over. Um, I'm, I'm helping out as much as they allow me to do a lot mm -hmm. of the structure stuff, um, just because I still want to claim some of the kids. <laughs> but if you have children, uh, youth, um, that have decided that they wanted to still be a part of this, please send them our way. We won't tell them no. We haven't told anyone no. There's, there's not an application that we're looking at and saying, no, you can't be a part of it. If you submit your application, you get an acceptance letter from, from us. Um, everyone who sends us a letter, we send an acceptance letter to because we want to teach you. At the very least, we want to teach you how to organize a board. Mm -hmm. We want to teach you how to ask you all for money. They went home last on April vacation with how to do a budget and then ask you all for money. So don't yeah. expect them not to do that to you also. Um, Good, we have, expect that. Yeah, they have no idea that we ask for money for stipends for them. So they're, they're gonna think that they're asking for the first time. That's great, um, that's great. So we're, we, we're literally teaching them how to um, really continue the efforts that started in 2020 today. Um, and so if you have someone, please send them over. It's, it's not a capacity issue. There's not a person in our office that wouldn't jump in to continue no matter how many children we have. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm happy that I asked. I mean, it, it does seem like there's a willingness to expand it, and it's not going to be um, overly burdensome is the only word that comes to mind, but it's for a lack of a better term, um, and just trying to expand that um, and maybe try to get some tangible policy recommendations from them. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this, um, we do have a turn it around group in Charlestown that I've invited you to. Yes. I would love to um, in Please send invite me you. Invite. I know we sent it in like during the holidays, but if you can send me another one, that'd be great. For sure, June 20th. So we'd love to have you there. It's the third anniversary. Yeah. So we'd, we'd love to have you there. Okay. Thank you so much. I know that's my time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Attorney Everett, I think my first questions are mostly around um, numbers. Your, um, I think it was the review board um, decreased in by $50,000. Can you tell me why? Yes. So when we first had our, all of the budgets that we had for our civilian review board were set up in a way um, so that everyone, as you know, gets paid $100 an hour, $50,000 a year. And um, just looking at a budget, anal analyzing the budget, no one has hit those numbers. So the money, the budget was just adjusted to what has happened over the last two years. So it, it's, it's really just looking at the cost savings that has always happened over the last two years. They meet four times a year, um, so it, the budget's just adjusted to that. I see. Thank you. Um, and in, in the event that, or do you have any efforts um, to increase them or increase attendance, and in the events that it does, how will you cover the costs? So if there is a chance, so we do have, so right now the budget is, the meetings are set for four times a year. However, like you said, if there is something that happens where they have to meet more because of the caseload or they ask the staff to come back, there is wiggle room in our budget. John typically just reaches out to budget and asks so that we move money around. So um, I'll let John tell you a little bit more how that works in the budget area, but um, we typically just call over and or send an email over and say that there has been an overage and money's just moved over to support the effort. I see. Yeah, if, if I had to guess, I would assume we would just cover it with salary savings um, closer to the end of the fiscal year because I wouldn't imagine that that would occur um, prior to at yeah. least the middle of the fiscal year. So we'd have to check in with OBM about that. But um, yeah, that shouldn't be an issue. And you would contact administration and say, we need an increase in civilians budget, civilian review board budget, and they would increase it? Yeah, so as you would imagine, what OBM tries to do is, is base everything off of actuals. So um, like the director said, 
they've reduced that based on, we now have, I mean, the full probably calendar year, 2022, we had full board set up. So um, we're now getting a better picture of what it's gonna cost to compensate that board for the amount of times they actually do meet. So it's just uh, getting closer to actuals on that one. Thank you. Um, on the list of your scope of work, you mentioned research and uh, distributes information about BIPOC hiring, promotion, retention, and termination practices. Um, is that is that the extent of it? It's just research and disseminating information. I see. Yes. So this that's the reason why I asked for the consultant because that's what says in the that's the, that's what's requested in the semiannual report, um, and so seeing that language, I asked for a consultant to dig deeper so we can get more information. I see. So is that is that also embedded in your policy that you'll be able to suggest to or ask the consultant to go deeper? Is this something you can do where you could just say go deeper without any type of pushback from the police department? It wasn't in the audience that says I couldn't. I understand. Um, and so the currently you do have nine members in the civilian review board? We do. Um, and then um, I guess for the for the youth, um, sorry, you call them Youth Advisory Council. Youth Advisory Council. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, or have there been any um, interest in expanding that, maybe a contract to partner with third party agency or nonprofit that creates, you you mentioned this holistic approach about um, violence prevention. So closing the wealth gap is one way. We, as we know it, um, violence is directly uh, uh, a result or um, almost always a result of uh, poverty or racism. And so when we close the wealth gap, when we are educating people, when we are equipping people with the tools to live a more holistic life, when we are curving social determinants of health, then we are supportive, then we are preventative um, in our efforts. And I appreciate that thought, that holistic thought. Um, I guess in terms of the Youth Advisory Council, has there been any um, efforts or do you plan to partner with any agencies that could create uh, maybe a mentorship program to extend your program beyond um, the advisory council? I have not thought about it, but since you have brought it up, I'd be happy to talk to you about that when this hearing is over, Counselor. All right, um, thank you so much. Um, look forward to having that conversation. Um, I really appreciate it that your, uh, your response to Councilor Mejia about, you know, we can't fix it overnight. Um, and in terms of this problem has always been here, um, systemic oppression and racism um, is, has always been here and still here, alive and well, especially in Boston. Um, and when I say it, I think that it hurts people's ears or, I don't know, hurts their feelings. And that's a good thing that people don't want racism to exist. Um, but inevitably it does, and it's embedded in our systems. And Boston being at the very top uh, possibly the most racist city in the country, um, systemically and otherwise. And so I wonder then um, when we are looking at, for example, your department and you're working with a system, like you happen to be probably the only uh, department that's intentionally accountability, intentionally supposed to be watching over or monitoring a department. How has the police department responded to you? How have they cooperated? I think it's the internal revenue that you're supposed to work with as well. Um, how have they, if, if, if at all, been receptive to you? So we have, um, we've been fine. We have literally created systems within um, our two departments in order to receive documents. Um, I, when John was doing his presentation, he said that we had to, we do get documents from Boston Police Department, including body-worn camera footage, in order for us to do our work. Our investigators need to be able to review police reports, body-worn camera footage, um, 911 tapes, terror tapes, things of that sort, in order for us to do investigations 
so that we are aware of um, what the complaint is so we can make recommendations to our civilian review board members about those complaints that come in. Um, we also have worked on policy together. There are some challenges that all departments will face within each other that are not, I don't believe that there are big challenges. We're still waiting on a few things that we need to do, but we're also sorting through with ourselves in the post commission. Um, we haven't had any challenge that I would say, which, you know, this is stopping us from moving, or we, we, are not, we don't have, I don't think we have the challenges people think we have. I think our challenges um, are created some of just trying to work through the ordinance and also work through the post commission. But um, I have a good working relationship with the commissioner. I have a good working relationship with the um, members of his command staff that um, help move our work forward. Um, but nothing that gives me pause or makes me feel like we cannot be successful in either one of our work or efforts to really be um, front and center on accountability and transparency. But again, just our challenges aren't with each other. It's really just trying to make sure that we can get our collective work together done, um, but based on things that probably are just not really in our control. Um, the police received an increase, the police department received an increase, and I understand that that's not your budget. Mm -hmm. um, however, it, based on your work and what you've observed in terms of um, diversity hiring, um, would you say that increasing police officers in the police department is the solution to increasing diversity? I think that if you increase um, diversity in the police department, I, and I wouldn't say just on the force, but in all um, levels of the police department, you know, there's the IT department, there's the policy department, there's the clerk's department. There's so many divisions within the B, uh, BPD that one, we should let people know, this is what I made about getting to know who the Boston Police Department is. It is not just um, officers. Um, so that's one thing. So you, one, we should start with, let's figure out who Boston Police Department is. Let's get to know them. You can't know what you don't trust. Um, but you should also have people who live and work in this community, who know our culture. I often give the example of the um, Caribbean Festival that happens every year. If you have someone who, um, an officer who is not familiar with the Caribbean Festival, they're not going to know what Juve is. They're not going to know what's going to happen during the, the last two weeks of August. Um, and if you get a call to come to certain neighborhoods and you think the music is too loud or something is going on, you're going to be shocked at what's going on. We're going to have a great time and it's going to last for longer than what you may think it is. And the reverse of that, on the police side, um, and it happened to me last year when people were calling my name at Carnival and they're like, why are all these officers you know, coming after this one person or walking up to this one person? Why does it take so many? And it's like because our police haven't like, really talked to the community about why they move the way they do during Caribbean festivals or in the parade period because it's more of them, more of us than them, right? And we should be very aware of why things happen during a parade on both sides. Communication has to happen. But it's easier when you live in this community. It's easier. I can't teach you culture. I can teach you rules and I can teach you procedure, but I can't teach you my culture. Right? I can expose you to my culture, but I can't teach it to you. And I think that's the difference. Um, and so do I, do I think that we need more people who are from here, more people who live in a community, more people? Yes. But you also have to get people to want to be in this field again. And I want people to feel that it is a profession they should be in again, because I can't change what's not there, right? So I want people to feel that they should be police officers again. When we were younger, we used to get badges. Everybody used to get little badges when they were in elementary school, and they'd be proud that we're a police officer or a fireman for the day. Um, and that's like kind of gone away. And, but then we have people who don't share certain values of yours because we're not applying for those jobs. And we should figure out what it is, where's that disconnect? When, more importantly, when does that disconnect happen? You um, alluded to different things, uh, right? So relationship building, you need trust in order to have trust. You have to know me. In order to know me, you have to be exposed to certain cultures and practices. And, um, but you're a body that, or you're a department that is supposed to, is the accountability department. And but to, in order to do this work, then there's all of these different connectors. Um, 
the nuance of preventative measures and services, mentorship, getting to know the police department, cultural competency, cultural competency, all this stuff. And you, then you, I guess, I guess, you know, without, have, without trying to branch your department into like all of this like nonprofit services and stuff, um, how is your department working with maybe outside independent departments, but also with the police department? Um, to oversee that they are working on reform or they are working on the other, or does your department um, have any purview over that at all? No, I do. I, I think that's the one thing. If someone asked me one day, is your job different than what you thought it was going to be? Yes. Um, I think that most people, again, thought, oh, you're going to come and you're going to accept complaints and you're going to go away. But it's not. It's so much more. Again, it's individual family community, right? And so the there's so many things that you have to do, and if you just look at that, and you look at all the prongs that are connected to it, all those things matter. It's not a or, it's an and. All the things that you just named that I said, it's because it's an and. Those are the things that we talk about every week in our office. It's an and. Um, so I do meet with different community partners. I've met with Lee Pelton and the Boston Foundation about, hey, how can you get more public safety jobs for dreamers? who may want to go in public safety spares, right? So yes, I have those conversations. I have conversations with King Boston. I have conversations with BCYF. I have conversations with now, oh yeah. Um, I have conversations with different departments and nonprofits about what can we do collectively or can I hand this off to you? And can you do this to help in this area? Um, and it's a lot of meetings, there's a lot of things. There's things that keep me up at night and things that wake me up real, real early in the morning. Um, because I think a lot of people don't realize how much um, police misconduct or police interactions, I should say, are connected to a lot of what we do. Um, thank you. The advocates, um, I think last week, um, and youth advocates as well, over 50 kids showed up and were advocating for, I think, 2.4 million um, kids. If you're watching, um, I might misquote that. It might be like 2.6. Um, to be removed from the police department, to move to um, BPDHC, so Boston Public Health, to uh, execute RFPs or contracts with nonprofits to do some of those crisis response. Um, it's about trauma-informed crisis response. And um, I'm not going to ask you to opine on whether or not that should happen, but I am trying to figure out um, in terms of what's missing. We are funding BPHC with a lot of money for public health as because they work on social determinants of health. Um, I think we're underfunding your department, but also reasonably underfunding it for now because you are a brand new department considering. Like, you need at least five years to be fully functioning. And, but then we also know that, for example, your office could possibly be the connector to implementing or to it, advising on what should be happening in terms of crisis response or in terms of the research that you have in order to inform these contracts that go out or the need. Um, do you have any comments about that? I do not. I don't have an, I don't know anything about the money that was coming or asked for for um, the kids that came in last week. I apologize. Um, I do agree with you that we do need more time to grow. Um, I do agree that our dashboards are great to give you a lot more information. Um, to really help determine when, you know, a lot of things are going on in our city. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have one uh, person signed up for public testimony, uh, Melissa Henderson. Okay. Melissa, if you can make your way to the microphone, state your name and affiliation and address, uh, or if you feel comfortable. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. My name is Melissa. Um, I literally just typed this, so I'll try to be as quick as possible. Thank you all for being here today, and thank you for having us. I already learned a lot so far. Um, we've heard the quote, sunlight is the best disinfectant. It's said to be the best disinfectant. 
electric light, the most effective policeman. And maybe some of us remember what Jesus himself said in Matthew 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In 2015, a community ombudsman oversight panel, a co-op member, spoke on the state of the Civilian Review Board. I think this board has a unique opportunity to seize on the moment. In other words, it's not an investigating body. It is designed to review the decisions made by internal affairs. It's basically that, a recommendation. There was no requirement that the department follow through or that they do anything. Judge Regina Quinlan's remarks are sourced from a 2015 report from WHDH7 News regarding her role on the Community Ombudsman Oversight Board, which was created by then Mayor Marty Walsh. In fact, so much time has passed between co-op and this budget hearing that Judge Quinlan had time to get married to becoming Mrs. Regina Quinlan hyphen Doherty. Why is Boston still grappling with issues of accountability and transparency when it comes to the oldest police department in the country? A department that derives its roots from fugitive slave patrols and was in initially tasked with protecting property, such as commercial shipping goods, and surveilling and monitoring early forms of counter-economic forms of upward social mobility, for example, gambling and the sex trade. The oldest profession and the oldest police department in the nation, what a match. The Boston Police Department of the late 19th century also disrupted labor union organizing of large waves of Catholic, Irish, Italian, German, and Eastern European immigrants. Perhaps this is a diversity, equity, inclusion approach to policing that I keep hearing about. Some suggestions. Remove all fees related to viewing public records of litigation in which the city of Boston and or the Boston Police Department are litigants, regardless of if the city is a plaintiff, defendant, or merely a deponent in a civil litigation. Also, since this governing body and the mayoral administration really are into what's going on on the internet, a clear and common sense social media policies for uh, city employees, including and particularly Boston Police Department employees, needs to be drafted with, um, and implemented with extensive public input. BPD employees should be required to reveal and register with the city any and all social media accounts not associated with the duties and tasks of their jobs. All Boston municipal employees, whether they are police officers or condescending snarky library staffers at the Boston Public Library, must be required to identify themselves when asked by a member of the public. The skewed power dynamic of an employee of the municipal government and a member of the public cannot be understated, and it is in these encounters that privilege, abuse of power, and sentiments of impunity thrive. But of course, the power remains to the pe- with the people, and to that end, the, the people of Boston demand that the city of Boston implement a universal basic income or guaranteed income pilot program, which will allow, among other things, the public to purchase supplies such as iPhones, Go- GoPro cameras, and other such technology equipment to document encounters between the public and Boston municipal government workers and officials. Again, these are merely suggestions. The public will continue to watch you. The Boston municipal government is, after all, accountable to the public, to the people of Boston. And I quote with, uh, I close with a quote from 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Um, to uh, to the panels, um, if you, do you, if you have a comment um, or a response, uh, feel free to. Um, if not, um, I as you see, we're here alone. Uh, any closing remarks? No. I thank you, and I look forward to having a conversation with you about the connection for our youth advisory council. I wanted to um, say that I think. I think that that is your idea. Um, I know that I said it in a different way, but because um, I've I've spoken with you and I I hear um, this sense of um, this holistic nurturing approach that you have um, about you, and um, and I know that this is something that is extremely important um, and long overdue uh, to be able to begin with something small to exemplify what should be manifested in our societies um, is brilliant. And I applaud you for taking it on and doing the going above and beyond to be able to start a department in short of two years to grow to this capacity. Um, I believe in you, I think that you're remarkable and I look forward to seeing what else you, you can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hearings closed.